Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us for the Injury Prevention Plus Seek QA Program Wave 6 learning session. Um, we have made it to this point, and we have made it to Wave 6, and we are very happy about it. Uh, thank you always to our program partner, the Ohio Department of Health, and their Violence and Injury Prevention Section, or VIPS. And I wanted to introduce everybody to the Injury Prevention Plus SEEK program team for this wave. We are very happy to welcome Dr. Uh, Jordi Wells, uh, who comes uh, to us from Nationwide Children's Hospital. She is our new medical director and our DEI context expert. Uh, we will uh, continue to work with uh, Dr. Liz Lendrum from Cincinnati Children's Medical Center. Uh, we are very happy, happy to have her back. Uh, we will also be working with uh, Zainab Abdali again as our data analyst. And I am Brooke, your program manager. Uh, so the agenda for today, uh, we will go over some wave six highlights and then hear from Dr. Wells on social determinants of health and uh, practice applications for counseling in the primary care setting with an equity lens. Uh, we'll have data review with Zainab and next steps from me. Okay, so welcome everybody again. And in the chat, if you could please share your name, your role, your practice, and if you attended uh, online, the food and security webinar that was on October 30th. Um, uh, there are uh, quite a few QR codes kind of throughout this uh, slide deck, and here is one that will link you to the food and security slides and presentation. Uh, if you didn't get a chance to attend on October 30th, you're welcome to scan that QR code now and get credit for watching that. Uh, but if you could uh, let us know that you are here in the chat. Okay, so wave six highlights uh, are you. Thank you for participating so much. We have a very good group uh, from all over Ohio and we are thankful to have you uh, know how important SEEK is to your patients and caregivers. Uh, we will be having kind of a new focus for wave six and we'll be providing a DEI focused education related to social determinants of health. We have added race, ethnicity and insurance provider fields to the SEEK screening tool. Uh, so those, for those who have done SEEK in the past, uh, you will see those additional fields uh, added to the screening tool. So it'll make the screen tool look a little bit different from wave five and previous waves. Uh, we will have a DEI lens review for other topic presentations, a DEI focused data report out on some of the action period calls. We will uh, pull out kind of the focus that we we're looking at and collecting uh, from the, the new data fields and take a look at those. Uh, we'll have a translation option added to the online screening tool. You'll get a preview in a couple slides here. And then uh, translation of SEEK resources into uh, more languages based on the needs of your practice. Uh, I sent out a poll uh, via email, and then we will talk about it again today. Uh, but we are getting an idea of what languages are spoken in your practice via some polls and some questions. And then a new topic for uh, the educational pieces is marijuana safety. We, we know it's a hot topic here in Ohio. Okay, uh, another poll time, uh, just to get um, you to be able to fill in uh, what other languages uh, you see in your practice. Um, the online or the email uh, poll didn't allow you to fill in what other was. So we are going to launch one more poll to kind of capture that information. And I will launch it here. Dr. Wells, is it showing up okay? Yes, I did, it popped up. Thanks. If you can't uh, type in uh, safely, if you're listening to the call on your uh, phone or from the car, uh, we will have uh, another opportunity to talk about languages in your practice. So if you can fill it out, that would be great. Few more seconds here for the poll. Okay, um, I have captured your answers. Um, if you didn't get a chance to answer, we will talk about that in the future. Uh, but thank you for filling that out. 
And on to Dr. Wells, I have your slides. Awesome. Are you going to drive my slides then for me, Brooke, or? I'm happy to do that, or you can share if you would like. Um, I will, I'll have you drive just to, um, just to not necessarily switch it up right now. Um, from there. So welcome everyone. Thank you so much for this session. I'm very, very excited uh, to uh, be the new medical director um, for our Injury Plus Seek program. Um, I don't think it's quite a coincidence that I'm taking over from Dr. Gittleman, um, who is also an emergency medicine physician, um, as I do feel as though um, there's a lot of overlap in being able to um, see the importance of, of screening for injuries and for social determinants of health and really understanding the importance of the medical home and the primary care setting uh, for um, that screening and collaboration there. And uh, I'm excited to add a bit of a focus and applying and talking about how to and apply an equity lens um, uh, in this practice as we go along. Uh, next slide, please. I do want to say I have no uh, any disclosures to report at this time, but this program is sponsored by the Ohio AP and funded by ODH as an acknowledgement. Next slide. All right. So I do want to talk and begin this case, uh, this discussion with a case study. This is taken right from my um for my residency uh, days in which I was in continuity clinic. Um, uh, during this time, it was my full month of continuity clinic and I had uh, newborn visits for two new twins um, that came to residency clinic. They were two weeks old. They were um, 36 weeks gestation. There was a C-section. There was no complications um, in their birth um, uh, or in their postnatal period. Um, we talked a bit about sleep, safe sleep. We were not doing social sc need screening at that time in my continuity clinic um, uh, from there. And they were expected to come back um, in um, in six at six weeks of age. Um, we were going to do a weight check at that time. And we were also uh, planning to get their uh, first vaccine vaccines in. Um, but uh, they did not show up uh, for that for that next visit um, that was scheduled for them and um, were considered as lost to follow up in, in our clinic. Um, and, but we did see through that they had gone to the ED a couple of times um, in in those months, but we, we couldn't quite get them um, back and, and scheduled to to get back into the primary care clinic. So at this point in their age time, I was uh, out of uh, my month of, of doing continuity clinic and I was just uh, doing my one week half day um, throughout. So I was on my ED rotation um, at this point and they um, uh, in that two months uh, from there and I was in the ED and I was a senior resident um, at that time. So I would respond to any of the EMS encodes that came in. And we did um, that day on my shift have an encode of an EMS um, code blue um, that was coming from a, a, a three month old and they were about five minutes out. Uh, from there. So I would go with my attending. We went to uh, the trauma bay with our team to prepare for coming for that coming in. We didn't know much of what was going on, but we knew, did knew, know something was coming in. Next slide, please. So we found out that it was a, uh, the EMS came in from the home of my three month old twins. Um, I didn't know that at the time, um, when they presented, they, uh, twin was found, um, in mom's bed, uh, pulseless and unresponsive. And they were still doing active CPR as they were arriving into the ED trauma bay. Um, they had not placed an airway at that point. I did that um, on arrival um, from there, but we continued to do CPR on um, the child for about 30 minutes, but we did not have any return to spontaneous circulation. Um, so the child was pronounced dead in the ER, uh, unfortunately. And um, it was not until after that um, resuscitation was complete that I had time enough to go into the chart and really do a more extensive chart dive to, to see at this patient and realized um, that their last visit in primary care was with me. Um, so doing a chart dig, we learned a few things. Next slide. And we learned um, that 
these twins lived just less than a mile away from, from our hospital. Um, we learned with talking to the family, as we always have a social worker who was there at our resuscitations that, um, over those past two months, they had a, a few reasons why they were unable to keep their appointments and some were some transportation challenges, uh, unpredictable work schedules, some lack of social support. And I did, there was a document of unhealthy sleep habit. Um, I remember this because it was uh, a new uh, code that we were definitely starting to use in our continuity clinics. Our attendings were wanting us to document that because it usually would indicate um, at least how we did it, that where the readiness of change were, we did the, the counseling and, um, and we were talking to caregivers about where, you know, where they were ready to change in terms of um, sleeping habits. And so that was there, but but we didn't have much more documentation um, other than that about um, any counseling. And then um, we found out that the families didn't have any um, funds to purchase a crib. Um, so things that we learned that were surrounding the death of this, um, of, of this child, this twin um, in the case of this family. Next slide, please. And the constellation of those um, really are in the social determinants of health. And those are the necessary resources like food, housing, economics, and social relationships, transportation, education, and healthcare, whose distribution across populations determines length and quality of life. There are many different definitions of social determinants of health. This is a very good one. And I think it is to me because in particular, we're talking about the distribution of these resources across populations. It's important to acknowledge that a single individual does not own a social determinant of health. They may have health related social needs as this family did. But when we look across populations, how are these resources distributed amongst different groups geographically, um, as such to help determine the length and quality of life um, in that time. Next slide. So today, the big objectives, uh, the big three that I want to look at are to learn about pediatric injuries and social determinants and how they impact uh, children. We want to understand how to incorporate an injury and social determinants of health quality improvement project um, at every well child visit and also describe the tools necessary to apply an equity lens through an injury and social determinants of health QI program. Next slide. I think some of you may recognize um, this picture of this gentleman. It, um, it is Dr. Abraham Jacoby, who is known as the father of pediatrics, um, who really uh, championed pediatricians to move beyond the bedside, uh, quoting him saying, it is not enough work at the individual bedside in the hospital. In the near or dim future, the pediatrician is to sit in and control school boards, health departments, and legislator, le legislatures, understanding that the impact on child health is well beyond the bedside, and it is important to advocate for that. So giving a nice um, driving message of social action um, towards um, our role as pediatricians. Next slide. So I always say, uh, usually there is, uh, everyone has their favorite slide or look of health equity. Um, and, and this is gonna be my depiction of it. On the right, um, we certainly have um, uh, three uh, children who are trying to see on the top of the counter. Um, and um, we have two different depictions of what that looks like. And so equity is known as kind of the absence of avoidable, uh, differences amongst groups. And what we really want to look at is what is the difference between equity and equality? Um, next click, please. So on the left-hand side, we have three children looking over a counter. They all have um, the same size box uh, stool in order to do this. And this is often how healthcare is, is that we often are given the e every child is given an equal amount of care. Doesn't matter what the differences in risk of their health is or, or what needs they may have individually, they're all getting the same. And that is really a more equal way of providing care. Um, and it gives us differential results in how well we're able to achieve them. So on the left side, 
all of these children are getting the same step stool, but they're not able to necessarily reach the uh, reach seeing over the counter. The for but when we take an equity approach to saying we're going to match the needs. Um, of each individual child with the resources that they require, we get the, the depiction on the right where we have a child who didn't need a stool at all in order to see over the counter, um, able to do that. We have one who needs about two stools to, to get there and one who needs probably about double that for in order to, to do that. And so as we move toward equity and we move toward um, trying to make sure that we're matching our needs with the resources, that also allows us to move toward kind of a, a concept in medicine that is continuing to evolve and thrive, and that is justice, um, to make sure that we are, are achieving um, that equitable care amongst the children that we have. Next slide. So I wanna talk about a few examples of health inequities um, and kind of the domains for which they live under. So uh, in uh, education, um, research has found that black mothers with a high school education are 2.2 times more likely to have an infant death um, in the first uh, year of life. As we look at income, we have come to learn that lower socioeconomic status is associated with an increased risk for heart disease, arthritis, diabetes, respiratory uh, diseases, mental illness, um, as well as certain types of cancer. And when we think about access to resources, a lower income and racial and ethnic minoritized communities, they are less likely to have access to grocery stores with fruits and vegetables. So these are things we know, things that we've seen um, as differences and think about what, what can we do about them and what's next. Next slide. So I like to always think about what does this mean for us and, and where is Ohio ranking in, in overall health value um, compared to our other states? So in um, health value is going to be determined by overall population health um, as well as our health care spending. So population health measures in terms of our life expectancy, um, infant mortality, different disease specific prevalence and in uh, and incidence um, is going to rank Ohio uh, 43 out of 50 states. And then how much do we spend on our health care? Um, we're ranked 28th which when we add these together, we become 46 um, in the out of 50 in the in the country. And this is specific or 2019 data. Next slide. So what does that mean for us to be ranked where we were? And what that means is that when we look across the health continuum uh, in the lifetime from birth to adulthood, there are many different experiences um, throughout, um, whether it be adverse childhood experiences, child poverty, when we look at certain education measures of preschool enrollment, high school graduation, and college enrollment, as well as um, other um, indicators of adult incarceration or employment. These are where Ohio is measuring against other states in these particular categories. And what does that reflection mean when it comes to an equity standpoint? So looking at child poverty, we're 35th out of 50, meaning that over 110,000 Black children in Ohio would not be living in poverty if the gap between white and Black children in Ohio was eliminated. What does that say about high school graduations is that over 11,000 Ohioans with low income would actually graduate high school if the gap between low income and high income Ohioans was eliminated. What are the things that we, what does this mean? It means that too many Ohioans are left we're behind. And if we don't have a strong foundation um, of how we're going to meet needs with resources, not all Ohioans are going to have the same opportunity to be healthy. Next slide. So that was 2019 data. I want to make sure that we look over the time. And so within the past decade, Ohio's health value has ranked in the bottom quartile um, since then. And what are the things that are making up these, these rankings? Next slide. This is all from the Health Policy Institute of Ohio, and our contributing factors are access to care, our health care system, uh, public health and prevention, looking at social and economic environment, 
So are, are some of those social determinants of health uh, values that we're looking at in the physical environment. And these factors are all weighing in on our population health and how much we spend on healthcare. So that is how we're getting to 44. Let's look a little bit deeper as to what those contributing factors might look like and how they um, perform. Next slide. So causes for lower equity. This is really a slide in a picture, uh, looking at a pictures of differences, what's missing, what's not there. So when we think about our social environment, thinking about social capital and cohesion, what adverse child experiences um, are happening or discriminatory environments um, that our children are residing in. What about our economic environment, our socioeconomic status and poverty? As well, when we look at the pictures of a nice full and lush grocery store versus what might be available to you in your neighborhood, um, um, if you're in a low income uh, family, what does that look like? As well as the physical environment, um, thinking about indoor physical environment elements, mold, roaches, um, or outdoor um, physical environments with lack of green space. What do these differences show from one neighborhood um, that we're looking at um, that might be more lush with plenty of playground, sidewalk space to, to go around versus those who may have homes um, that were that are not up to code, that are definitely um, uh, not safe necessarily environments that you would um, choose to, to be in. And what does that mean? So what does it look, what are the what are the uh, factors that we think about? And then really giving a visual look about what does that look like for a child that's going to grow up in that in that environment. Next slide. So when we think about um, social determinants and we think about needs, um, there are very there are a few different buckets of um, of larger um, domains that we talk about: health service environment, physical environment, economic environment, and the psychosocial environment. And uh, below those um, big buckets are different uh, measures and outcomes um, that we can that you can look at that are going to uh, be a part of that larger one. And so when we think about moving action um, on these particular things, how do we move the needle forward, particularly on the poverty rate or household income or home ownership and educational attainment if we're looking under economic environment? What are the interventions that we potentially could utilize in order to do so? And so I love to use this slide as, as really a a roadmap um, for certain things that may be applicable to your environment, something that you can reference and go back to because there's a lot of different um, uh, interventions that have been um, studied and used to be effective in combating these things. And what's fantastic is that many of these inter interventions can be started in the primary care office. And those that are starred um, in this way are ones that we have um, seen been used and being used successfully um, in the, under those dif different domains. So definitely one um, to kind of go back to um, as we won't be going through everyone individually from there. So this is this is the mechanisms for us to be moving toward action on these elements that we're seeing in our communities, things that are affecting our families, and things that can be started in the office. Next slide. So uh, the CDC um, uh, in their safer, healthier people um, domains uh, recognize these as social determinants of health and different uh, ways to uh, different important. Uh, uh, resources um, and domains to consider when we are addressing those. So also a use for um, some, uh, some self-study um, to go back as a resource from there. Next slide. So while we also, while this SEEK program does a lot with social determinants of health, we also want to talk about injury anticipatory guidance. Um, injuries are the leading cause of morbidity and more mortality in children and cause more deaths um, than all diseases combined. And because of that, counseling parents about injury, risk should be a part of every well child visit. As studies have shown that it is effective in increasing uh, injury knowledge for our caregivers, uh, for changing uh, their behaviors, including uh, increased motor vehicle restraint use, using smoke alarms in the home, and talking about safe sleep practices, as well as reducing um, injuries and injury risk, especially those now some in the home, including falls, as well as uh, automobile crashes um, there. Next slide.
So in order to, uh, to go further, we want to talk about a practical approach to address injuries and as well as social determinants in um, the clinical setting. Next slide. So the Ohio AAP um, Injury Prevention Learning Collaborative developed a screening tool with talking points and resources for patients birth one to, uh, from birth to one years of age. And it was a QI initiative to increase counseling um, and tool usage. And so they did this collaborative and found that the tool was easy to implement um, in just about two, one to two months. It reduced time, um, especially with providers in their encounters because there were tailored injury messages. And that 65% of parents uh, and families reported at least one behavior change following counseling on injuries. So we so found out that this is a good thing. Next. Then the Safe Environment for Every Kid Seek program um, was a program to screen for health-related social risks. And so this was um, done because those who are unemployed and have lower socioeconomic status, um, uh, those parents have a greater risk for premature child death. So screening for these risks, we're trying to understand what, there are, what they are to help match need to resources. And with doing this program and screening, um, this program found that there were no additional provider time needed to implement the program. And that positive results were fewer CPS reports, fewer instances of medical neglect, fewer children with delayed immunizations and fewer incidences of severe physical assault. So this also being a good thing. Next slide. So let's make this a great thing and combine these two programs. So the Ohio AP Injury Prevention Program and SEEK plus SEEK was developed um, to were combined and developed to be used by pediatric providers using a QI methodology in order to consistently screen um, for injury uh, for injury risk and health-related social risks and provide targeted uh, counseling and resources respective to that. So we've had five waves since 2017 and allowed members to participate and receive MOC credit for that. Um, we were also able to later compare um, uncovered uh, injury prevention and social uh, determinants of health risks and resources um, that were offered because of that. And also looking at, we're able to kind of further develop this program and look at topics addressed after the tool in order to be able to put some of those into practice uh, from what we learned from prior waves. Next slide. So the screening tool um, that we use in SEEK um, addresses both injuries and um, unintentional injuries and social determinants of health. So um, in this chart here, you're seeing the topics that are covered in both of those areas, as well as um, in the different age groups that we have with 20, uh, 37 questions for uh, for those uh, birth to one and 35 for those one to uh, 13 months to five years. Um, so the column on the tool has uh, uh, high risk response areas, talking points uh, to aid in the counseling of, of those who would have right, um, high risk and the resources um, that would be relevant to provide uh, related to that. And the program um, provides tools and talking points and also wider nets of um, resources that are both county, statewide, and nationally uh, based resources that um that are able to be provided to those who participate in our program. Next. So on, in our quality improvement project, we have several elements that are going to make up um, uh, our, our QI program. And one is the core program team within your practice, which can include a nurse, uh, a doctor, and an admin support as well. We will have kickoff calls um, and that will allow us to have Q QI program specific uh, specifics to detail what we're what we're going to do within the program and also uh, collect some baseline data. Um, throughout, there'll be some QI training, baseline data review, and tool use um, in 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 practice discussion. We will also have some monthly period monthly action period calls, which will allow us to. Uh, 
do some data review as we're going through our program, discuss any successes and barriers um, to program implementation, as well as um, educational sessions um, as well throughout our period calls. And there will be two PDSA cycles um, that will be submitted uh, throughout the program. And that's how we are structured um, uh, for Injury Plus Seek. Next. So the data that we're going to collect throughout the program, the first is going to be baseline data, where you're going to randomly select charts for two of our age groups, those birth uh, from birth to one years of age, and then those 13 months to five years. And we will you will uh, submit those via SurveyMonkey. Then we will have actual data collection when you're using your screening tools that will be real time via the electronic screening tool. And we have seen that this process has been a lot easier since using the iPad. And then finally, our data analysis, which will be completed and shared um, monthly by our data analysis after you submit your, your data uh, to us to review. So we'll be able to see those steps of change as the program is being um, uh, is, is gone going and see what those changes are to your baseline data. Next. So briefly, I want to share a little bit of results from some of our prior waves to let you know um, what how the program is working since its inception and also how it's changed and how our results have led into some of that change. So in wave one and two, um, when we look at our kind of baseline data in our practices, um, in our two age groups, well, there's about 70 to 100 charts that are, are being reviewed. And at baseline, when going through the charts, they're seeing that 30, about 30% 30 or so, 25 to 30% of the injury prevention and seek topics, the ones that were kind of in that chart, those were addressed in baseline before starting this a program and before using this tool. And the most common ones for those birth to one were, were safe sleep um, counseling, as well as car seat uh, safety counseling. While it's into 13 months to five years, it was more about um, the ability to care for a child and also maternal depression. So once we started to do the injury seek and use the electronics um uh, a tool. Um, then we looked at our charts um, after that. So over 300 charts were reviewed in both group age groups, and about four to five risks were identified per family on average. And the most common ones um, that were identified was no CPR training um, uh, from caregivers and also car seat safety. And so by the end of our collaborative and using the Injury Plus Seek tools, we saw higher re risk responses were counseled um, over 80% of the time in both um, age groups. And that had a 52% and 62% increase from the baseline um, in both age categories during wave one and wave two. So we definitely saw a big increase in being able to do so, to um, have that counseling for those high risk responses happening. Next slide. Slide. We're going to talk about um, wave four. So the baseline in wave four was a bit higher um, for injury topics at 83%, um, but social determinants of health topics about 44% in the baseline for those practices at that time. Um, but on completing the tools and going through the QI program, injury topics were discussed and social health uh, and social determinants were greater than 99%. Um, uh, discussed and the risks were identified and addressed by providers in there. So a still a, a large increase in, and definitely in the direction we want to go. Um, and home safety in wave four had the most significant change in terms of discussion rate, increasing from 55% to 94% by the end of the program um, in the practices used. So we saw um, that great in, uh, increase uh, since uh, instituting those the screening tools. Next slide. And wave uh, four, we were also able to, and we won't go through everyone, but I think it's really important to, when you're doing screening surveys and you're thinking about how we are um, measuring uh, risk, is we're able to dichotomize and look at what are the most common questions where we're showing minimal risk, where where our responses from our caregivers are, are showing that this is not really an area that we're we're seeing high, high risk um high risk responses that need counseling um, to be. So we looked at not only what are our high risk 
our minimal risk questions to think, are, are some of these still extremely relevant that we need to, you know, screen for, or how can we change the screening questions um, to make sure that we're we're getting um, at that. So we looked at the minimal risk questions, and then we also, next slide, looked at the um, common questions that showed higher risk. Where are we seeing that we definitely have a lot of, um, of, of positive responses for which we need to do counseling and then potentially also lead to resources um, and how, you know, and how, um, how we might need to further address these. So I really like in wave four that we were able to do this because it allows us to, to really understand where, uh, what uh, counseling and what risks are most high in our populations. Next slide. Wave five um, and uh, our most recent wave, we really wanted to address caregiver feedback. So we looked, um, we talked about and looked at topics that address for readiness for change and kind of action steps, and also compared those responses to national averages. So we get feedback directly from the patients after they've screen got their screening done and received counseling and resources to understand where they are in their readiness to change. And so in this chart here, looking at our data, we have different uh, domains that um, we looked at, but most of our caregivers were either ready to change or seriously considering change. Is ready to change is orange, and seriously considering change is our yellow um, coloring there, with a very, very low percentage of those who were not quite ready or, or had no thoughts of changing. So we understand that the counseling that is happening after the screening is really supporting caregivers to want to make change and, and, and make some action steps based on that. So understanding how meaningful are, you know, is our screening? What is that doing um, kind of on the back end for caregivers? So this was a wave four, hi a five highlight um, that we were able to, to kind of see our impact there. Next slide. And wave six. So wave six um, is is you, um, and we're very very excited um, here and to talk about the new additions that we're having. So we did kind of do the poll a little bit earlier today to kind of understand um, what resources might be translated based on the languages um, in the populations that you serve in your practice. So hopefully you were able to fill that out. And if not, we'll follow up because we want to make sure that translation um, is not a barrier for being able to screen your patients in clinic. But importantly, we're adding race, ethnicity, and insurance provider feels to the screen, seek screening tools. And there's a lot of reasoning and a lot of history behind why we think that's important. We talked about health equity um, a lot earlier in the beginning of the discussion, and this, um, this element here has a big role in it. And so a lot for a lot of people, the um, topic of health equity and health disparities has really had blown up um, in the past four years and really had settled around for a lot of people and brought it to their kind of forward um, mind uh, in the events uh, uh, in the events following uh, George Floyd's death, and that was a big explosion. I feel like in medicine in general for these for these discussions of health equity, of DEI, of whatnot. But I I want to kind of take us back a little bit in history to talk um, about um, why we find it important to add this data into the Seek screening tools, and and what is the history of 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 talking about um, health disparities in um, in this country and how we've evolved to the place we are. So next slide. So really, that discussion could really start at the inception of our of our country, but in a more contemporary way. Uh, pictured here is Margaret Heckler. She was the um, Secretary of Health and Human Services uh, in the eighties um, in this country, and she. Um, has a report. It was it was uh, started to be known as the Heckler Report, but it was actually the report on the Secretary's Task Force on Black and Minority Health. And so this was a big study that they had looked at in HHS. Um, and the foundational um, kind of conclusion from this was, despite the unprecedented explosion in scientific knowledge and the phenomenal capacity of medicine to diagnose, treat, and cure diseases. Blacks, Hispanics, Native Americans, and those of Asian Pacific Islander heritage have not benefited fully or equitably from the fruits of science or from those responsible for translating and using health sciences technology. So it was 1985. This was a landmark report that was put out. And I want to talk about where 
how we got to this, how, how they got to this measures in the next slide. So the way that they got to this conclusion is they looked at what they called the big six, which was cancer, cardiovascular disease, chemical dependency, diabetes, homicide and accidents, and infant mortality. So they looked at all of the data related to these big six topics. They looked at that data stratified by race and ethnicity and the outcomes of these different groups and came to the conclusion on the prior slide. And because of those, they decided these are going to be our eight recommendations. These are going to be our roadmap into how we're going to 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 uh, settle with these um, with these findings and try to bridge the gap um, for which um, we can have more equitable care and that is health information outreach. They had cultural awareness and responsiveness, access delivery and financing of health services, health professions development, so the development of the workforce and what that looks like, um, federal and non federal co cooperative efforts, data development, how we look at data and, and are able to stratify data, which will become important and also a research agenda. So this was a roadmap that was built in 1985 about um, about these things and a roadmap that I think is is something that could be uh, that could be still that is still relevant today and built upon today. So next slide. So what happened after this report? Let's take it back in history. Is that in, so that was 1985 that the Heckler Report went out and then HHS created the Office of Minority Health in 86 and the CDC, the Office of Minority Health and Health Disparities in 88. Moving into the 90s, the NIH um, developed their own Office of Minority Programs in the 90s. And then throughout the 90s into, into the 2000s, states and territorial offices created offices of minority health and health equity, in which I would say Ohio actually created the first um, in the nation um, Office of Minority Health. And same time in that year in the 90s, um, the Office of Management and Budget revised the classification on data, federal data on race and ethnicity in 1997. So understanding that it's going to be important for us to stratify our data in order to understand our outcomes between different groups. Within the 2000s, um, we had the class standards that were released. Um, and in 2000, they created the Healthy People 2010 goals that over that next decade, they wanted to overarchingly eliminate health disparities, the Institute of Medicine um, uh, released their landmark unequal treatment um, uh, findings and confronting racial and ethnic disparities in healthcare. And AHRQ issued their first national health care quality and disparities report. So, based, you know, that this is that timeline from that that landmark Heckler report until the early 2000s and 2003. Next slide. And so unequal treatment for a person uh, like me, while I am an emergency medicine physician, I do a lot of research in health equity. This particular um, uh, IOM uh, um, landmark study really becomes a guiding light. It is it is a a uh, anyone doing this work usually has this either in their desk or in their library because it is um, the Bible of sorts to um, to kind of thinking about how we're going to address health disparities and the steps that are needed to do so. And so I always like to, to make sure that we talk about this particular document um, there, and I want to go over a few of their findings. Next slide. So the finding one. A finding one of one in this report was that racial and ethnic disparities in healthcare exist, and because they are associated with worse outcomes in many cases are unacceptable. So this finding number one says that we know that they are there and that we are unacceptable, therefore we must do something about it. A really important um, a message um, that came in 2003, very similar to 85 in terms of these are still persistently going on, but another way of um, that we are, um, that these results were analyzed and looked at and decided, what are we going to do about this? Finding number two, next slide, was that racial and ethnic disparities in healthcare occur in the context of a broader historic and contemporary social and economic inequality and the evidence of persistent racial and ethnic discriminations in many sectors of American life. This was um, a also important um, finding, and I think that the one that becomes very relevant to the screening that we're doing um, uh, in the SEEK program, because we're looking at the broader context of the children that we um, 
that we serve in terms of looking at their health related social risks as well as um, their um, as well as their injury risks. But it's important to understand that in order to understand how each set of groups are doing disparately, it's important to understand what the racial and ethnic makeup of the uh, respondent are so we can do those comparisons um, as necessary. Next slide. So this is the um, uh, a, a chart that also came from um, that work in unequal treatment. And it's really looking at the quality of care between non-minority and minority patients. And so they decided um, in this chart that um, the, the biggest factors related to um, the differences in quality of care um, were clinical appropriate needs and need and need uh, and patient preferences, the way that the healthcare stop system operates and the legal and regulatory climate. And then there's also discrimination, biases, stereotypes, and uncertainty. Now, in this particular um, depiction, the differences that they say, well, you know, some of the differences in here are okay. Um, differences in what each patient needs, what each patient's prefer. Um, there are going to be some things that are changed there and those are, are okay. And there's going to be some elements um, that, that, um, that, that we are on, that we are we are okay with having a difference for versus a disparity which is on the other side saying that those are really related to more of how the healthcare systems operate and 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 it probably also has something to do with maybe some discrimination and biases and so so those are where the disparities are are go and we don't like those but some of the differences are are okay which when we think about the larger climate of the social and economic differences in education, it makes me really question whether some of those differences, those differences in clinical appropriateness and patient preferences, um, I don't understand how some of those may, may not be considered disparities. So turning this on its head a little bit in the next slide, trying to apply more of an equity lens to see those differences and saying that regardless the fact that there's a gap between minority and non-minority patients in this country regarding to their optimal health care, all of that is an inequity. And so all of that gap may have very different reasons as to why that's happening. It could be overarching societal structural racism and discrimination. It may be how our health system uh, operates in the legal and regulatory climates. It could be provider barriers um, that include bias, stereotyping, and uncertainty, but also patient barriers. So not leaning on the clinical appropriateness and, and patient uh, preferences, but thinking about what are the patient barriers that may be because of failed relationships that they've had um, with their providers, lack of trust may be maybe the result of the patient preference to not choose one treatment versus another or internalized racism. What are all of these factors? Um, how are they contributing to an inequity? So thinking about that and really kind of thinking about the context, um, especially also from the patient perspective about why um, certain things are happening uh, to one group versus another. And so um, next slide, please. I think this is going to be one of my last points to um, kind of the importance of how we look at data and making sure that we are, are, are seeing the full picture. Because I think without um, being able to stratify data, we may not be getting the whole picture. So this is particularly the uh, infant mortality rate in the state of Ohio. And in 2020, Healthy People 2020 wanted um, the goal for infant mortality rates to be uh, six down to six deaths uh, per thousand live births. So when we look at Ohio across the years, we were at 6.8, we, we went up to seven, and then slowly coming down and started to really approach six um, um, at that goal. And, and most people would have said in Ohio that we made it. We we got our goal. We we did um, everything that, that we needed to do um, if we were to just look at this state. 
as data. Now, if we're able to have the capacity to look at data and um, stratify it by race and ethnicity, what picture uh, will that help us get a fuller picture? Well, next slide, we're gonna do that with um, black and white infants in Ohio. So as we follow along um, the curve, if we look at white infants, um, we look at our state health improvement plan, our target is six, that was also in line with the Healthy People 2020. And we could see that we were just above six at the top of 2009. And as we looked across the decade to 2019, we're 5.1, we were better um, than, the, um, than, than the target. So, so that's great for those, but when we compare that to black children, we were well above um, more than double at 14.2 and really had stayed static through the entire decade. So when we stratify the data, we see how far we are from that goal. Um, and it's really important to, to know because this is how we decide where, how we're going to get to equity. We cannot do everything for the same um, group because if we actually apply that equal um, chart, if we reduce um, each group by 10%, we're just gonna continue to um, keep this gap that we have uh, persistent as opposed to trying to tailor resources to communities where they have the greatest need. So what I think is important, uh, why I use this example is, is that by adding race and ethnicity um, to our street screening tools, we're going to be able to stratify our data in a way that we have not been able to do in the past um, six way, uh, in the past five waves, um, which is a reason. This is a very um, studied approach when we're talking about health equity um, and such. And so that is um, what we're really excited for and really excited to partner with you um, to help us understand our data a little bit better and how we can um, make sure that resources are being tailored um, to where the greatest need is um, in terms of injury prevention, as well as uh, identifying health-related social needs. So I think that that is my last slide and happy to, uh, oh, we have one. So we're, um, so the, what we want to conclude with today is that our primary care uh, providers can implement screening tools um, in their well-child visits to evaluate for injury prevention and social risks that our injury plus seek screening pool has increased screening topic discussion and resource distribution from baseline in our past five ways. And we expect that to continue in wave six families with children less than five tend to report more unintentional injury risks. And there are common trends uh, to what that looks like. And that stratifying our data helps to tell the whole story, which comprehensively addresses and eliminates uh, health disparities. So I think I have questions on the next slide um, from there, which if we need to, I know it's 12, 53. So if we need to get through the new slides and add that to the end, that's totally fine. Dr. Wells, thank you so much. Your passion comes through and wave six is lucky to have you. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, uh, let's uh, revisit questions um, throughout the program. Uh, we can certainly revisit this and you will be a touch point uh, for the next eight months. So it'll be great. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, Zainab, you are up. Thank you, Brooke. Uh, thank you, Dr. Wells, for the lovely information that you shared. I'll try to go quickly over the next slide. Um, I know that some of you have to leave, but um, I would really appreciate if you could listen well for this for this slide. So I know that um, collecting data and putting data in the iPad and, and giving us uh, baseline data can be a little bit time consuming. Uh, but I mean, I'm going to give you some information about why we need that data, how that data is going to help you in your practice. So the goal here is to advocate for the children, right, to, to improve their quality of life. Um, and to, you know, to just improve the, uh, the appointments that we're having. If, if a family has some sort of need and we know about that need, um, it's, it's great for us and for the family, for us to be able to provide them with the information that they need. I know Dr. Wells was giving an example about her, the twin babies that she, um, <clears throat> that were her patients and, and if they had known about the needs for, of the family, then um, it could have been the death of one of the infants could have been prevented. Um, so we are collecting baseline uh, data. I know that you received uh, some information about the months that we're collecting baseline data for, but the purpose of this is just to for us to know, for us and for you to know um, what your practice looks, now, lo looks like now. 
um, how you guys are performing, where there are some areas of opportunity, where we, where, what specific umbrella topics we can improve on. Um, and that kind of also gives you some idea of how, um, you know, towards the end of the program and to, into sustainability, you know, what are the things that you were doing well before the program and what are things that you can probably work on or put a little bit more um, of your energy towards. Um, so active QI data is collected um, in real time on the iPads. Um, it's, you know, it's available and it's it's available to us for us to identify um, the needs that you're having or the needs that your patients are having and for you to identify that as well and to provide resources, to provide some sort of discussion um, based on those indicated needs. Um, and again, this allows us to advocate for the quality of life of the of the patient, right? So if the patient says, oh, we were struggling with food insecurity or uh, the primary caregiver or the mom is struggling with um, depression or struggling to find a job, then we have all of that information on our resource sheet. We understand that sometimes these appointments can be very short and you don't always have the opportunity to talk to the family about the needs that they indicate, but um, providing them at least with that resource sheet, they do have some information on there, some QR codes that they can scan to kind of um, push them forward and to help them with some of those needs. Um, we're also asking for monthly patient totals, and that is the total number of patients that you saw that month. Um, this is for us to, to kind of know how your practice is performing in terms of how many of your patients are actually being screened or receiving the screening tool, right? So um, we know that, for example, you have 35 patients in the month of December um, and 32 of those patients receive the screening tool, then you are performing pretty well. Um, again, this is information that you can use for your practice. This isn't information that we're going to use to dock you any points or um, to withhold any credits or anything like that. So don't uh, be shy or ashamed if you're struggling. Um, we're here to help. Um, and if we do see that you're struggling a little bit, then you never know. Like maybe there's something that we can do, Brooke or I or Dr. Wells, that we can do to kind of help you um, get those numbers up. Um, it's very important that you submit at least. Um, I, uh, the QI data is, again, submitted in real time. Um, so this is mostly for the baseline data. Um, it's very important for you to submit that data on time. Uh, we will work on being flexible with you um, in case you need any extension on that deadline. Um, but please remember that um, your MOC credit depends on a timely submission of your baseline data. Um, and again, going back to sustainability, um, we understand that it might it might be a little bit difficult. Um, and if you can, then great to continue to to provide the screening tool after Q, after the QI months or after the project is done. But again, this is again where baseline comes into place. Let's say your practice was doing pretty well at providing resources for car seat safety and safe sleep, but um, was had an area of opportunity in terms of home safety. Um, so, you know, you know, now you can know where to focus more of your efforts in the sustainability period. Um, and knowing that you are already doing pretty well in a few topics, then you can focus a little bit more of your energy on improving the other few topics. So um, that's all I have. Um, I, I know I spoke pretty fast, so um, we, we, we can talk again during our action period call if anyone has questions or during our um, practice coaching calls. So uh, Brooke, I can hand it back over to you. Zainab, thank you so much. And yes, uh, you are correct that we will go through all of this, especially uh, the slides that we will kind of rush through now on the kickoff call. So um, I'm going to leave all of these for the kickoff call. I have, please know that I will pull those in. So next steps. Speaking of the kickoff call, um, if you don't mind uh, scheduling uh, with me uh, between uh, November and December. So we have um, about two months before baseline data is due. So we, uh, throughout the kickoff call, we'll talk about program implementation, how to do the baseline data collection, uh, the screening tool tech, and then the QI data collection training, and plenty of time there for Q&A. Uh, so if you and your uh, members of your office haven't done so already, if you could please uh, complete the uh, Seek Pre-Work Survey. Uh, this is on SurveyMonkey. And before I forget, if uh, it is safe for you to do so, uh, for those who haven't, please put your name, role, and practice in the chat before you log off, please.
Uh, and to receive program materials by mail, this will kind of coincide with scheduling uh, the kickoff call. Um, if you could have all the participating providers in your practice uh, complete the following, attend or watch on demand the learning session. That's right now, that's today. Uh, I will let you know when it's posted online to watch on demand. Um, complete the pre-work survey uh, and schedule the kickoff call via email one hour uh, with me uh, and Zainab to talk about um, everything that uh, we'll summarize today and then talk about how to do the program itself. Uh, and if you could also in that email uh, with the dates and times that you are available, give me a good mailing address for you so I can get the program materials to you. And then I'm um, recommending that uh, you and your practice uh, schedule the kickoff call as early as possible. Uh, we want you to have as much time to submit the baseline data as you can. And again, that's due January 10th. Uh, and again, next steps, uh, this is just uh, for you to start kind of reviewing um, the things that we have available for SEEK. So we're going to reference a lot the SEEK resource page. Um, an example on the lower left are the uh, safety vignette videos that we have posted. You'll see them kind of lined up there. They're pretty great, and we're proud of those. And then um, you can click through the education modules while we get um, everything kind of uploaded on the page. And um, please know that the um, SEEK resource page is always um, being added to and always under construction. So if you don't see your county listed for a resource, please know that it'll be added in time. Okay, so thank you everybody for going two minutes over. Uh, please bring your questions via email to me anytime uh, and bring them to your kickoff call in November and December. Looking forward to speaking to all of you uh, about the program uh, in the future. And Zainab and Dr. Wells, thank you so much. And thank you everybody for joining today. Have a good day.